Welcome to Stonebridge Online. Just before we start the service, here are some announcements and things to know. During this time of worshiping online, it's important to continue contributing to the ongoing ministry of Stonebridge. Here are the ways in which you can give. You can give online through our website at stonebridgecme.com. Click on online giving. You can give through your bank's bill pay option or by mail. If you'd like business reply offering envelopes sent to you, please contact the church office. In just a few weeks, Pastor Neil will launch part two of his message series on the Gospel of Mark, titled All Things New. With this new message series, three types of group life will also be offered. Growth groups, prayer groups, and at-home worship. Experience your own spiritual blessing by joining one of these groups, either in person or by Zoom. To sign up or learn more, contact Barbara Waite. On Saturday, September 12th at 5.30, we will have an outdoor worship service on the front lawn at Stonebridge. Join us for worship, a message, and some fellowship, six feet apart, of course. Registration is now open, so please visit our website to register before the 12th. Our Board of Deacons not only helps the needy in our community through monthly donations to the Samaritan Center, Sarah's House, and Action, they also provide confidential support, encouragement, and assistance to members of our church family. You're invited to support the caring work of our deacons by making a special offering on the first weekend of every month. We would love to know that you're participating in worship. Please continue to share your news, prayers, and praises by emailing prayers at stonebridgecme.com. Or if you're following along in version, please take the time to fill out the e-connection card. You are an important part of Stonebridge's community of faith. Once again, welcome to worship. Hello and welcome to Stonebridge Online Worship. I'm Associate Pastor Jonathan Lucia. Did you know that we don't call God into worship? God calls us into worship. And despite all that has happened this week, God, you call us and we are here. We didn't stay on track. We missed the mark more than once. But God, you have called us and we are here. We missed opportunities to trust you, God, and we tried to handle things ourselves. But God, you have called us and we are here. Sometimes our faith may feel stagnant. Sometimes our faith may feel blasé. But God, you have called us and we are here. We are here. And what we need is here. God, open our eyes that we may see, open our ears that we may hear, open our hearts that we may receive what you have in store for us today. Amen. Again, welcome to worship.
I spoke a word, you were singing over me. You have been so, so good to me. Before I took a breath, you breathed your life in me. You have been so, so good to me.
Hi, Stonebridge. When Pastor Neil gave me today's scripture reading, he told me it sounds more like CDC guidelines than scripture. It comes to us from Mark chapter 7, verses 1 through 8. The Pharisees gathered around Jesus. So did some of the teachers of the law. All of them had come from Jerusalem. They saw some of the disciples eating food with unclean hands. That means they were not washed. The Pharisees and all the Jews do not eat unless they wash their hands to make them pure. That's what the elders teach. When they come from the marketplace, they do not eat unless they wash. And they follow many other teachings. For example, they wash cups, pitchers, and kettles in a special way. So the Pharisees and the teachers of the law questioned Jesus. Why don't your disciples live by what the elders teach, they asked. Why do they eat their food with unclean hands? He replied, Isaiah was right. He prophesied about you people who pretend to be good. He said, these people honor me by what they say, but their hearts are far away from me. Their worship doesn't mean anything to me. They teach nothing but human rules. You have let go of God's commands and you are holding on to the teachings that men have made up. Hello, Stonebridge. Is there one thing we as Christians need to do, need to be about as followers of Jesus? Think about that and let's talk about it in a minute. First, this week we wrap up our series on the first half of the Gospel of Mark, a series we've been calling Under New Management. We've called it that because Jesus announced the kingdom of God is near. The, new, the world is under new management and Jesus is the new manager. Next week begins a new series called All Things New. Jesus takes a radical turn and describes exactly what it takes to live in the kingdom under his new management. We're calling it All Things New partly because of Jesus' new direction and partly because we're starting a new outdoor service that weekend and partly because we are having a new season of growth groups and we're starting prayer groups and at-home worship groups, all in socially distanced, properly masked conditions. We're calling it All Things New, but for many people, many Christians, whenever we receive the invitation to live into Jesus' all-new management, we choose instead to live all things old or all things stay the same. And unfortunately, sometimes that means all things get worse. It all hinges on whether or not we do this one thing. I'm stealing a phrase from Stephen Covey, the author of Seven Habits for Highly Effective People. He was a very smart person, and smart people have a way of saying obvious things in ways that sound genius. Stephen Covey is credited with saying, the main thing is to keep the main thing the main thing. I mean, duh. <laughs> and wow, it's so obvious, but also so important. In fact, this is the one thing we need to do if we're going to live in the kingdom of God under the new management of Jesus. We must keep the main thing the main thing in all of our activities. Let's be sure we stay focused on our clear purpose, our reason for existing. Of course, there are activities and traditions we love that aren't necessarily the main thing, but maybe they're related. There are times uh, for taking our foot off the gas of accomplishing our primary objective. But these things should never detract from or take the place of our primary goal or purpose or reason for being. So what is our primary goal, our purpose, our main thing? We'll get to that in a minute. But first, what happens if we don't keep the main thing the main thing? What if someone or a group lost track of or couldn't keep doing the main thing? But didn't want to disband or felt that keeping something about the main thing going was still important, so they started doing something else and didn't do the main thing anymore. We don't have to imagine what that would look like. We can see it today at Virginia City outside Reno, Nevada. Here's a sign you see driving into Virginia City today. That sign says it all. Here is the way Virginia City used to be. It used to be a boom town. The first major silver deposit discovery in the United States was right there and created Virginia City. But in 1878, the silver ran out. And the main thing was mining silver. The silver was gone. Time to pack up and go somewhere else. That was 
over 100 years ago, but Virginia City is still there. So today, we can visit there and walk from the Bucket of Blood Saloon to the Silver Terrace cemeteries and wander through dozens of souvenir shops and ice cream stores and restaurants with people dressed in 1800s clothes. There are all kinds of things to see and to do in Virginia City. Just about the only thing we can't do in Virginia City is mine silver. The main thing ended a hundred years ago, but the city lives on. In Virginia City, they talk about mining silver. We can buy silver shipped in from other places. We can tour tunnels where they used to mine silver. The people of Virginia City honor the memory of the miners, but their city is far from actual mining. The same thing happens to religious institutions and the people in them. Jesus said it this way, These people honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. Jesus was being pretty tough, and he hadn't finished yet. He kept going, and he said this, They worship me in vain. Their teachings are merely human rules. You have let go of the commands of God and are holding on to human traditions. It's not coincidental that Jesus refers to the commands of God. The religious people back then were very concerned about following God's commands. They had, after all, the Ten Commands, Ten Commandments. And we might just ask the question, what's this all got to do with the main thing? What is that main thing? Later in the book of Mark, these religious leaders ask Jesus that pretty much same question. They asked it this way, of all the commands, which is the most important? Does anybody remember Jesus' answer? Jesus said, love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your soul and with all your mind and with all your strength. The second is this, love your neighbor as yourself. There is no greater, there is no commandment greater than these. So what's the main thing for Christians? We should be able to deduce it from these two commands. But we can narrow it down a little bit more. Jesus later told his followers, a new command I give you, love one another. So let's not complicate this. Jesus summarized all the laws and commands of the entire nation and the history of Israel into love God, love others. Then he looked his followers in the eyes and commanded them to love one another. I'm no smart person like Stephen Covey, but I think I'm safe in saying the main thing for Christians is love. Immediately when we say that, we get pushed back. We hear and perhaps we think, well, yes, of course, but what about, you know, Christians across our country have created entire lists of statements that could finish that sentence. I would not be surprised if one or two issues or concerns came up in your mind just now when we said that. There are many important issues facing Christians and others and our nation, and many are very complicated. When does addressing those issues become more important than loving one another? Imagine for a moment there was an organization filled with people whose number one goal and passion, whose main thing was to first love the other people in the organization and then their neighbors as the natural outgrowth of their love for God. Imagine that organization exists in our world right now and faces the same concerns we all face. If we went to a meeting of that organization, would the people, what would the people be like? What would it be like if people from that organization lived on our block, if their kids went to school with our kids? What if people from that organization worked with us, or ran for public office, or served as police officers, firefighters, teachers, doctors, nurses? We can name some people who might have been part of that organization. Mr. Rogers, Martin Luther King Jr., Mother Teresa. What impression would the general public have of a community filled with Rogers and Kings and Teresas? Think for a few seconds about words that come to mind when we think of those people, others like them, and communities filled with people like them. If you're watching this with someone else, between you, name a few of the words that come to mind. I'll wait. All right, have you had a chance to think about that? What are the words that come to mind when you think of that amazing, loving community or amazing, loving people? All right, raise your hand if you said any of these words, judgmental, hypocritical, 
too involved in politics, out of touch with reality, insensitive to others, boring, anti-homosexual, not accepting other faiths, confusing. Did anyone raise their hand? Those are the words of thousands of young people who use those words to describe Christians in an extensive survey uh, by the Barna Group. And their thoughts are captured in a book called Unchristian. Now, to be fair, that book was published in 2007. So Christians have had 13 years to improve millennials' impressions of us and the impressions of the general public for that matter. Do you think we have changed anyone's minds for the better? So let's review briefly. In this interaction between Jesus and the most religious people of his day, we see that the main thing is to keep the main thing the main thing. And according to Jesus, the main thing for Christians is love. So what do you have left if you don't have the main thing? That is what this interaction between the religious leaders is also about. He keeps talking about love and the kingdom of God and the way they want to talk, and they want to talk about tradition. After all, tradition is a big deal in the Jewish culture. Remember Tevia in The Fiddler on the Roof? Tradition. Okay, I'm not going to sing. But tradition is very important to that culture. Religious leaders challenged Jesus because his followers didn't follow tradition. In verse 5, we read this. So the Pharisees and teachers of the law asked Jesus, why don't your disciples live according to the tradition of the elders instead of eating their food with defiled hands? The Pharisees were talking about their tradition of pouring water or sprinkling water over their hands after being in the marketplace. They didn't physically wash their hands for hygienic purposes. They symbolically washed their hands, just pouring water or sprinkling water over them for spiritual reasons. It was a tradition. They even said so themselves. Jesus challenged them, saying they had substituted traditions like that for keeping God's commands. That was a slap in the face for those leaders. Here's how Jesus said it. They worship me in vain. Their teachings are merely human rules. You have let go of the commands of God and are holding on to human traditions. Remember, Jesus summarized the commands of God this way. Love God love others, and love one another. But that is hard. It's hard now. It was hard then. So instead of doing that, which is complicated and takes a lifetime of humility and growth and transformation, they did something easy, like sprinkling water over their hands. The message for us is, don't substitute tradition for love. They challenged Jesus about a seemingly insignificant tradition. And Jesus basically shakes his head and says, Gentlemen, because religious leaders in that day were all men, Gentlemen, your traditions are not the main thing. And the main thing is to keep the main thing the main thing. But I will tell you, their traditions and ours are not insignificant things. Traditions can impact all of society, including those people who don't follow the traditions. What then are our traditions that we might be holding on to at the risk of failing to keep the main thing the main thing? I have just one tradition to point out that we need to aggressively avoid if we are going to follow the command to love. It's our last point. If, just before I go to our last point, if the lighting has changed or something's different, I recorded this first part uh, yesterday. And overnight, I felt like I just needed to re-record this last point because it's so important that we understand this. And uh, this fourth point is stop avoiding cognitive dissonance. Avoiding cognitive dissonance isn't actually a tradition that we recognize, like serving communion on the first weekend of the month, but it is a habit many of us keep. It has swept our nation and it impacts all of us much more probably than the traditions we find in the Bible. First, let me tell you what cognitive dissonance is. It is the unpleasant emotion we feel when how we act contradicts with what we believe. Let me give an example. We believe we should love others. Now, we walk towards a homeless man with a sign and we begin to think we should help him. His sign says he will work for food, but 
we don't want to hire him and change our entire schedule to get him to our home to do some yard work. Uh, we continue toward him, and we think we could offer to get him some food, but we only have a few minutes. Maybe we can just give him some money. But we've been told don't give money because they'll just use it to buy alcohol. We don't even know the man or if that's his problem, but we don't seem to think that we have any options, and yet we want to demonstrate love. We're almost to him, and what are we going to do? That feeling we're feeling, maybe even right now, that tension, that tug, we feel those moments, uh, we feel in those moments is cognitive dissonance. And we don't like it. We avoid that feeling as much as possible. For example, we're almost to the homeless man. We're deciding between just smiling at him or avoiding him or stopping to talk with him. When another person coming the other way stops with a bag of food from McDonald's, we quickly step around them, say a little prayer for the man under our breath, and voila, we have successfully avoided the cognitive dissonance that was going on inside us. Now, had we not succumbed to our emotions, we might have been able to do something that is more congruent with our belief in loving others. So if the situation allowed, and if we felt safe, maybe someone else was with us, we might have stopped on our way back from wherever we were going and said, Hello, sir, I noticed your sign says you will work for food. Can I ask what kind of work do you do? And perhaps that would lead to a conversation, and maybe we would have a Starbucks or a Target gift card we can offer him. Now let's not get stuck in the details of that example. Please, let's focus on the point. Often, in order to actually love others, we must be willing to live and with our uncomfortable cognitive dissonance, at least long enough to move in a slightly different direction. You see, the Holy Spirit can actually use our cognitive dissonance to warn us that what we're thinking of doing conflicts with who we think we are or want to be. So let's look back at our example. We're walking towards the homeless man. And in this example, what we really want to do is avoid him. Our cognitive dissonance kicks in to warn us. Our first instinct to avoid him is incongruent with who we want to be, which is a loving person. Actually, we can be thankful for our uncomfortable emotions in that moment because they remind us that we really do care and we want to help. We could be totally oblivious or dismissive of that human being sitting with that sign. We might not notice them, certainly not care at all. In that case, as we walk towards them, the only feelings we would have are disdain or dismissal. Get a job! Don't block my sidewalk! I'm going to speak to the manager of this establishment. It's our cognitive dissonance that keeps us in the moment, forcing us to evaluate our actions in light of our beliefs. And that's uncomfortable. So we avoid it. We avoid cognitive dissonance, for example, when we refuse to watch or read any news but the kind that reinforces what we already know or believe. When we assume the worst about others, who we maybe see on television. When we watch our political party's national convention, but not the other parties. When we dismiss anyone who disagrees with us. When our only engagement with people we disagree with is criticism and challenge and dismissal. When we only see others as enemies rather than people with different perspectives. When we do that, we are not defending our faith. We are practicing the age-old tradition of avoiding cognitive dissonance. Now look, I, I am pointing fingers only at myself. This week, while I was preparing this sermon, a, a worker uh, that I know and have known for years was in my backyard. We're friends. He's someone I can listen to. And he started talking about COVID being a hoax. Well, my cognitive dissonance kicked in immediately because I, I wanted to be respectful. That's who I think I am and kind of thought we were friends. But I didn't want to listen to the kind of rationalization that is leading to the deaths and sufferings of people across our nation. So you have some sense of what my opinion is on the subject. 
But if I could let go of my uncomfortable emotions, I could be willing to listen to this person who doesn't threaten me, who's a Christian with a different perspective than mine, that I really don't understand. I could learn something and I could be more thoughtful, be more the loving person I think I am and want to be. So what did I do? I did none of that. I cut them off. I said, you're talking to the wrong person. And I started talking to him about the work he was doing in my yard and that's it. Cognitive dissonance avoided. I just stepped out of that uncomfortable feeling and moved on. Of course, that relationship was singed and I remain less responsive, less loving than I want to be. I need to stop avoiding cognitive dissonance. And don't we all? So here are five signs that we may be feeling cognitive dissonance. Squeamishness. Number two, avoidance. Number three, ignoring the facts. Number four, rationalization. And number five, the fear of missing out. So, to me, it seems like we can pick any topic in the headlines today and we'll feel some form of cognitive dissonance. Maybe it's wearing or not wearing masks, or protests against police, or just political candidates, or churches opening or staying closed, re returning to school, or saying or not saying Black Lives Matter. The reality is, we cannot keep the main thing the main thing. We cannot love God, love others, and love one another unless we're willing and able to sustain some amount of cognitive dissonance. That's because love and dissonance go hand in hand. Because we're not perfect yet. We are hurting people, often self-centered, frightened, angry, Worried people who need for ourselves to change if we are going to keep the main thing the main thing. So, when Jesus says you have let go of the commands of God and are holding on to human traditions, he's not condemning us. He's warning us. We need to heed his warning. We need to think about what organization we want to belong to. Is it the one with Mr. Rogers and Martin Luther King? and Mother Teresa? Or is it the one that thousands of millennials say we are a part of? I guess we'll find out, and future generations will decide if we kept the main thing the main thing. Amen. Thousand times I fail, still your mercy remains. Should I stumble again, I'm caught in your grace, everlasting. Your light will shine when all else fades, never ending. Your glory goes beyond all fame.
Thank you for worshiping online with Stonebridge Community Church. And now receive the blessing. Let us embrace God's unexpected wonder of this day and of this coming week and give us a fresh sense of commitment. May we go forward together in the power of the love of God and the company of Jesus Christ and by the leading of God's Holy Spirit. Amen. Go in peace.